again. This time we're talking about chapter 13. And I know I said last time we spoke that I wasn't going to talk about bacteria in this class, but this class is all about bacteria. And hopefully you understand why by the end of it or even the beginning of it. I'll just go ahead and tell you the evolution of eukaryotes depended heavily on bacteria, depended entirely on bacteria, right? We, we shared an ancestor, which was very, very bacteria-like. This is a picture of cyanobacteria. This is a photosynthetic bacteria, one we're gonna talk about a lot today. It's not the only photosynthetic bacteria, but it's an important one. So how did this have to do with the evolution of eukaryotes? Well, the evolution of eukaryotes is entirely because the, of the evolution of plastids. And we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about this over the next few lectures. This is a picture of some plant tissue full of chloroplasts, a plastid. The evolution of eukaryotes depended on the evolution of this plastid, chloroplasts, important for photosynthesis, but also the evolution of the mitochondria. We're not gonna talk about the mitochondria, but it was absolutely essential for the evolution of all eukarya. Right now we're going to talk about the, uh, the evolution of the chloroplast though. Well, when did this happen? We're going to talk next, next class is about the endosymbiotic theory, about how, how these bacterial cells became plastids. But why not, what kind of timeline are we even talking about? It's so hard to know because these organisms were tiny. They were single cells. They looked like bacteria and they when you find them in the fossil record, how do you know which ones are eukaryotes and which ones are just bacteria or archaea? Well, one conclusive piece of evidence is th those that have organelles, those that have chloroplasts. And there are some fossils, but 1.2 billion years old with clear signs of chloroplasts. So these are photosynthetic eukaryotes that are over a billion years old. And the crazy thing about them is they look almost identical to extant species. So can you imagine a species that's been alive for over a billion years? There's no proof that it's the same species, but it sure looks like it. There's even more recent evidence showing that these early photosynthetic eukaryotes are older. There's a fossil that's been dated to 1.4 billion years old. It's teeny tiny, size of, size of a grain of rice. I just wanted you to get a picture of what kind of organisms we're gonna be talking about, what they were like. Um, this um, Protoclatus antiquus, we're going to talk about this more on one of the Fridays because this was a Canadian group who made this discovery and they wrote a paper about it and it's a really good paper. All right. So before we get into it, I want to show you some pictures of microscopic eukarya because that's pretty much what most of this class is about, right? These are the early, early eukaryotes. There's so many of them that are still alive and there's so much we don't know about them. This first picture is a picture of Volvox. It's unicellular. Um, eukaryote, but they live in colonies, so they appear to be multicellular. They're just so cute. Like, look at that little flagella, the euglenids, desmids. These creatures are so beautiful and so otherworldly. I just wanted you to have some sense of what kind of things we're going to talk about. You're going to learn all about them in detail as the semester progresses. But for now, no, there's a ton of them, and they're really cool. Okay, so let's get back to the textbook. What do you have to know for the class? Well, only read the section. You only have to read the section on photosynthesis. I don't really care if you read the rest. You can, of course. Um, but what I want from this section is pretty straightforward. I want you to know what the different forms of uh, bacterial photosynthesis are. I want you to know what ecological role these creatures play and what the different um, lineages are, the phylogenetic lineages. But before we go there, let's just talk about photosynthesis. A little recap. This is like probably uh, elementary school recap. What is photosynthesis? Well, organisms that can use sun energy to synthesize compounds, right? Using sun to make food. But to do this, you need photoreceptors. Uh, you've got to find a way to capture energy in those photons and turn it into chemical energy. So light energy becomes chemical energy. That's the magic. That's what we haven't been able to replicate as humans. Plants and bacteria and protists really get at it. But to do this, you need chloroplasts, right? This is where the magic happens. 
And what is the compound in chloroplast that's so important? It's chlorophyll. It's, it's, a com it's a chemical that can absorb light energy and then funnel that energy down to the reaction center where it can be used to perform other reactions in the cell. And so from plants and some other organisms, this chemical, this photo uh, reactive chemical is chlorophyll and we've all heard of chlorophyll. It's not the only one out there and there's different kinds of it. Um, there's different formulations of chlorophyll and they're all active at slightly different wavelengths. I mean, there's A, B, blah, 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 blah. Um, there's more than, on, than is on this graph, but this just shows you basically for these photosynthetic pigments, now not all of them are chlorophyll, right? You've got beta carotene, erythrin, cyanin. Um, we're gonna talk about those in a few minutes, but there's, they're active at different wavelengths, which is really important because life attenuates um, in, in the water column. So if you're living in the water and depending on where you live, you receive a different wavelength of light. So different organisms have different photoreactive chemicals based on where they live. And that's key. That's really critical to how life evolved on Earth. But like I said, not only chlorophyll can act as a pigment. Um, there are some other uh, accessory pigments like carotene, xanthophyll, phycobilins. These are things that you've heard of probably and that you've seen, right? When the leaves change color in the fall, the chloroplast, the chlorophyll breaks down and it reveals all the other photosynthetic pigments that have been there the whole time. They've just been masked by the chlorophyll. And this is from your, uh, Yellowstone National Park in the States, right? You can see these aren't plants, these are bacteria with different pigments, different photosynthetic pigments. They're spectacular. Well, why do plants and bacteria, why do they have so many different pigments, right? I, it, it makes sense when you're talking about organisms living at different um, depths in the ocean because of light, light attenuation. What about these terrestrial organisms? What's the point of having so many pigments? Well, the point is to capture light, um, but light is different to matter, depending on where you live and depending what the conditions are. I mean, if you've been outside today, it is so smoky and the light quality hitting the planet is very different than it was last week when there was no cloud cover. If you live in a shady understory, it's different than if you live on the surface of the ocean. So different pigments are gonna be stable or active at different intensities and different wavelengths. And these black plants, they look black, but they're not actually black. They just have dark purple and red photosynthetically active cells. Where would they live? What kind of environment do you think they would live in? Well, these are plants, black or dark colors absorb a lot of energy. So you would think maybe in a place that was light limiting, they might live. Who knows? We don't know why. If they are in fact black, that would be a good reason. But we don't know. There could be other benefits of associating with blue or red or purple pigments that have nothing to do. That might be really intense, lightly lit. And these might be ways that they stabilize their biochemistry. But it makes you think, what would the color of plants be like on other planets with different conditions? And there's papers about this. Because a different planet would have different light quality and different life intensity, right? And different temperatures. What would, what would it look like? Well, they could be red. Vegetation could be entirely red or pink. Who knows? Um, it's interesting to think about because we just assume the green is the best color, but it's just the best for now. Doesn't mean it's always going to be the best color. Okay, let's go back to prokaryotes. Only three of the 17 lineages of bacteria have evolved photosynthesis. PS is my shorthand for photosynthesis. Cyanobacteria, which we mentioned briefly. These guys have chlorophyll A and phycobilins, and phycobilins are accessory pigments that help the chlorophyll absorb light energy. These uh, pigments are the ancestors of all other chlorophylls. So they're really important and widely spread in the plant kingdom. 
but there's other photosynthetic bacteria, the purple and green bacteria, and they don't use chlorophyll, they use bacteria chlorophyll, which is different. And that's all I want to say about that. I mean, we're going to talk about more later. We'll talk about the purple and green sulfur bacteria at the end of this class. The biggest thing difference between bacteria and plants in terms of photosynthesis is that bacteria can be autotrophs or heterotrophs. All plants are photoautotrophs. They get their energy from the sun and they get the carbon from their, the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. However, bacteria have more variable biochemistry and they can get their carbon from different sources. It doesn't have to be atmospheric. It could be decomposing organic material. It could be carbon that's stuck in a rock. Um, photo, sun, energies from the sun. Auto, carbon from CO2, makes its own food completely in, from the atmosphere. Photoheterotrophs use light energy, but they get their carbon from other compounds. And this is true for purple and green sulfur bacteria. Okay, I mentioned accessory pigments briefly. Um, chlorophyll or bacteria chlorophyll is this obligatory for photosynthesis. Accessory pigments can help and organisms are diverse in which accessory pigments they have. It's not universal. Um, carotenoids are, are an accessory pigment and perhaps the most widespread. Um, they're embedded in the cell membrane. There's no organelles, remember, because bacteria don't have organelles. They are the origin of organelles. So these carotenoids are embedded in the cell membrane and they transfer energy to the reaction centers of the bacteria chlorophyll or the chlorophyll to help the cell make ATP. And they're also photoprotectants. And that's why um, I think we're told to take carotenoids or carotene as a, a nutritional supplement because they're they're antioxidants, they help um, quench the oxygen that reacts from the, the photosynthetic reaction and protect the cell. However, if you think deeply enough about these kinds of things, carotenoids specifically, you wonder, I mean, carotenoids, carrots, right? They're named after carotenoids. What is the point of these pigments in carrots because carrots are underground. There's no photosynthesis happening underground, at least as far as I've been told. This, it's not happening. So why would the plant bother making these expensive chemicals and putting them in their roots? Well, what's interesting about that is that plants didn't do that. This is a picture of Daucus carota. This is the wild ancestor of carrots. Very beautiful. And this is what the root looks like. It's this pale, um, taproot, but it looks nothing like the carrots you see in the grocery store until, and you can see this in paintings, right? I think it was until in the six, everything up until the 1600s, carrots were white, but then after the 1600s, they became orange in paintings. And so there was some mutation and then selective breeding to maintain this variant within the population. So this was human human drove this trade in carrots. But it's really, I just love the fact that you can learn about the evolution of plants by studying art. Anyways, so there is no point of having carrots, uh, carotenoids in roots other than humans like them because they are nutritious. So it made sense for humans to select for that. Okay, let's go back to the evolution of eukaryotes from these photosynthetic cells. Um, how does it happen? Well, let's go back to cyanobacteria, right? These long strings of bacterial cells. They're called blue-green algae, um, but they're not algae. They are bacteria. They're single cell, but they can grow into filaments that can be really quite long for, for microscopic organisms. And they're blue not because um, of anything other than the accessory pigments that help the uh, chlorophyll A capture light. Because remember, chlorophyll A was the type of chloro fell used by these organisms. But what's really cool about them is if you look at them up close, you see it's a single cell of a cyanobacterium. You know, it's a pretty typical bacterial cell. You've got a cell wall, you've got DNA, you've got cytoplasm, and then you've got these things called thylakoids, which are the membranes that are photosynthetic, right? 
um, don't worry about this. This is just a metal metabolic waste or storage. But then you look at a chloroplast. So this is a chloroplast from probably a plant, I'm not sure. And well, they don't look identical because this one's kind of a different shape. They share a lot of features. They've got these thylakoids that are in this case stacked into grana. I don't know where the DNA is, but it's somewhere in there. You've got cell wall, cell membrane. They're starting to look a lot alike. And a creature like this, a creature like the cyanobacteria that exists today, made eukaryotes possible. Um, folded membranes with pigments, phycobilins, these photosynthetic organisms. Sorry, I skipped ahead became what we now know as chloroplasts to the endosymbiotic theory. And we're gonna talk about that in detail. I just wanted you to be familiar with the organisms that were the players. So I wanted to go through the bacteria with you. Okay, what do these guys do in ecosystems? Well, cyanobacteria are really important, part of the plankton, food web. There can be really significant blooms um, when it gets too hot or the, there's problems with osmoregulation and they can't maintain their buoyancy, you know, float to the surface. And they can be really toxic, right? They, the cyanobacteria have a lot of things that are poison to animals, including humans. The Red Sea was named after a bloom um, from red cyanobacterium, which was really toxic. I mean, they're... This is, a, this is a human health issue, right? If there's green algae in your water supply, people die. So in certain areas at certain times, there's, there's warnings that you can't drink the water because of contamination. And some people might not, I mean, might not even know what's in there. There's some thought that some of these chronic health conditions or progressive diseases like ALS, Alzheimer's, Parkinson are because of the neurotoxins released by cyanobacteria in our water systems. Not all water systems, but some of them. Um, so our, is our water supply contaminated? Some people think in communities which have high levels of these neurodegenerative diseases might be due to cyanobacteria. This is just an aside, but I thought it was kind of interesting. Okay, one of the other things I wanted to get away from this, mm -hmm. take away from this chapter was the different lineages of photosynthetic bacteria and how they're different. Well, we've got the um, aerobic, the bacteria that do aerobic photosynthesis, and that's the cyanobacteria. But then we've got the anaerobic bacteria, and they use hydrogen sulfide as an electron donor or organic electron donors. They're happening in the ocean or in the substrate. And there's purple and green sulfur bacteria that use hydrogen sulfate as a donor, or purple non-sulfur bacteria or green non-sulfur bacteria that use um, organic electron donors. So you can see these guys are part of the decomposer food chain. Okay, so three main groups. Purple and green bacteria, we haven't talked about them yet. Um, they're anaerobic photosynthesizers and you actually see them quite frequently if you go, um, if you're near the ocean, they'll form these little mats on the sand or if you pick up a chunk of sand, it might look, it might look sandy, like beige colored on top, but if you slice through it, you'll see layers of green, and purple, and those are layers of bacteria, active bacteria different levels. They like different levels of salinity. They like different areas of light, but depending on how high the tide is, they'll be the, the order of those layers might change. Um, in, in, by, in Kelowna, if you go to Angel Falls, um, or anywhere where there's a big sulfur deposit, you can see the mats of these bacteria. They're not uncommon. Um, Purple or green sulfur bacteria oxidize hydrogen sulfide for their electron, um, but the non-sulfur versions oxidize organic compounds. Now these are different phylogenetic trajectories, right? These are not closely related, these groups, they just look alike. I've covered most of this material. I'm not gonna be ever asking you about the chemistry of these reactions. I just want you to know 
that they exist and why they exist and how they're different in a big sense. Right? Um, different groups of bacteria reduce the sulfate and different groups oxidize the sulfide that results from that and results in the deposition of sulfur. And that's why it smells like sulfur where these guys are present because they're taking the energy from the compounds and they're intermediates and depositing sulfur as a byproduct. What about the non-sulfur bacteria, right? You can see here in this picture, you've got these colonies of bacteria that are, or this might be LG2, it's hard to see, say from this far apart, but this is definitely bacteria. Um, these guys are kind of interesting because they fluctuate between photoheterotrophs, photoautotrophs, and chemoheterotrophs. So chemo means they're not photosynthetic. They're actually getting their electrons from organic material or from uh, rocks. So they're really biochemically com complex and really versatile. It depends what, what form of metabolism they're gonna use, depends on oxygen concentration, where they're growing, right? If they have um, CO2 in the atmosphere, then they can use uh, atmospheric carbon, or if they're growing in a big lump of decomposing mush, they can use that. And how much light is available, right? Are they gonna be phototrophs or chemotrophs? But well, they're not gonna be chemotrophs if there's no light. Oh, they are gonna be chemotrophs if there's light, sorry. So why was photosynthetic bacteria pivotal for the evolution of, of photosynthetic eukaryotes? There's many different ways to photosynthesize. And I think that's a key point is there's not just one way to photosynthesize, there's multiple ways. And life looked, the different lineages of eukaryotes that we're gonna talk about look different depending on which bacteria became the chloroplast. The key is these organisms became the chloroplast for eukaryotes, but depending on who they were, eukaryotes evolved differently. Next class, we're gonna go through this really clearly. I just wanted this class to be about who the players were, at least who the bacterial players were. We'll talk about the other players in the next class. And I'll talk about how a bacterium actually becomes an organelle over evolutionary time. It's not, it's not immediate, it's not, or well, in some case, it seems like it's an immediate thing, but it's not really an organelle. There's all sorts of variations on this theme that we'll talk about next class. And at the end of every class, like I said, I wanna leave you some questions that I think are valid and important for your final. So here they are. And I will post these online with the rest of the information from this class. All right, talk to you soon.